Welcome to My Mind's Eye, where we talk about mind and brain and listen to music about those topics. Have I seen you lately? Today, we're with Yuri Buzaki of the NYU Langone Institute for Neuroscience. We're going to be talking with Yuri about his work on the hippocampus, rhythms, timing, prediction of the future, and even dreams. But it was a dream. Yuri, you grew up in Hungary in the, uh, behind the Iron Curtain during the height of the Cold War. I once read an interesting quote from you where you said that uh, coming of age um, in a repressive regime helped foster your interest in inhibition in the brain. I found that very interesting and immediately realized that some of the great work on inhibition has actually come from Hungary. Uh, your work, of course, but also Samoji and Freud. Why don't you tell us about what inhibition is why it's so important in the brain, and why the idea of inhibition might relate to repressive regimes. Inhibition is a very interesting concept, and it's a very important mechanism in the brain. We would like to illustrate what inhibition is about. Probably the closest thing is to accumulate energy. So think about a, a bow and an arrow, the most important weapon of my Hungarian ancestors. Uh, when many archers uh, accumulate the energy and synchronize the action, the impact is enormous. And uh, this is through to accumulating the energy very slowly. And of course, this is also true in suppressive regimes where, where suppression builds up forces and, and tension in individuals. And the result of which is that it can crush you or it can actually make you stronger depending on your level of, of resilience. Inhibition in the brain is different because there is a dedicated set of neurons which are doing nothing else, just inhibit the action potentials of the majority of the excitatory neurons. And this is this coordinating, synchronizing act that has fascinated me for a long time. Let's turn to the scientific climate that also shaped your work. You did your PhD with the pioneering neurophysiologist Andre Grestian. Um, so how did that seminal experience shape your eventual work on memory, inhibition, sleep, dreams, and so forth. Grosjean was a physiologist at the University of Page, where Janusz Sentagotai, the legendary Hungarian uh, uh, anatomist, was also a professor. They were very different groups and different people. Grosjean was interested in emotions, motivations, learning, and large questions. Uh, he introduced the term or the concept of inhibition to me. But in his world, inhibition meant something different. He meant how emotions can control our rational decisions. Now, Santa Gotai was different. He was interested in circuits and neuron types. He gave uh, wonderful poetic names to the neurons that he discovered, such as the chandelier cells that Peter Schumann later on shown. So in this climate, there was an open question left for me, which is what is the relationship between the concept of inhibition, inhibitory neurons, their coordinating roles of in, in pyramidal cells and behavior. You wrote a highly acclaimed book called Rhythms of the Brain. What's the, uh, the punchline of the book? The punchline is this. The goal of the brain is to predict the future. The predictive powers of the brain are derived from the multiple rhythms it generates. Every single time that opposing forces are struggling with each other, such as inhibition and excitation, the solution for some peace, for some balance, is through oscillation. The most interesting thing is that they form a system. The phase of the slow oscillation modulates the magnitude of the faster one, and the phase of the faster one modulates the amplitude of the even faster one, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
in place of the slow oscillation, because you have time, a much larger brain volume can be involved. When the oscillation is very fast, the time window is very short, so it's, it becomes very local. Now, inhibition comes as a natural pause, and pauses are very important in communicating information. The reason why you and I understand each other is because there are small pauses between syllables and longer pauses between words. And these pauses are secured in the brain by inhibition. I was personally very interested in your discussion of the controversy about how to um, uh, interpret the theta rhythm, something you wrote about in your book. Now, this rhythm occurs when the brain attends to the environment. And efforts to characterize this term led to a controversy about the role of, uh, of, of uh, the theta rhythm in volition or voluntary behavior or in a more grandiose sense in free will. Coming to North America, I realized that how important our upbringing is, how we view the world and how we interpret it. Uh, living in the Pavlovian scheme dominated East and the Soviet doctrine, the brain was nothing else, just a syn synthetic device whose goal was to associate. Action was almost irrelevant. So with Grashan, we tried to do experiments to see how different aspects of the signal were reflected by hippocampal theta activity. It struck me that nearly all words that we use today in cognitive neuroscience have been dreamed up already by people who had no clue that any of these terms have anything to do with the brain. So how do we hope that these man-created words with conceived boundaries have mechanisms in the brain which would correspond to these ideas? So I thought this was not comfortable for me. The goal of the brain is to act rather than perceive. Therefore I thought that in order to explore any mechanism, we need to understand it from the product a network makes. I can call it an actuator, I like to call it or refer to it as a reader mechanism. So we try to do everything in the laboratory from the perspective of a reader mechanism, whether it's a muscular action, whether it's a thought, or whether it's a population pattern such as the theta oscillation. When we were planning this interview, you said that you might want to talk about dreaming about the future. That's an interesting concept, so tell us what you mean by that. Dreaming is a mixture of the past and the future. As you know, the hippocampus is also a GPS, it's not only a memory device. So it seems that nature invented a mechanism to allow animals to navigate in the world with outside cues. When we travel mentally, we go back to the past and we plan for the future, but the algorithm and the mechanism are exactly the same when we are traveling around the world, physically. Depending on how you set up the experiment, the answer could be that the hippocampus is a GPS or the hippocampus is a memory device. And we make boxes, and these are the boxes that we constantly like to make, such as amygdala emotion, hippocampus memory, prefrontal cortex decision making, and so on. And we connect these boxes with arrows. My dream is that we don't need those boxes. We would like to have a picture of the brain without boxes and arrows. In the past several years, it turned out that the substrates and mechanisms for memory, planning, imagination, and dreaming are exactly the same. So the emphasis should be on the arrows rather than the boxes, because this is a dynamic that determines what the actual processes are and what the brain cares about. Dreaming is everything. This is, dreams involve our memories. Dreams involve our worries, fears, as well as imagined pleasures. They are internalized patterns and they occupy a very large part of the brain. It is the same process, perhaps, when we are planning our new experiment or writing a new song. That was my dream. And 
So have, have when you had the um, seahorses in here, you had a high level of water? Yes, we had high level of water up to here, and uh, it was, uh, we had a person who was maintaining it every day. Mm -hmm. I got an email around midnight that, look, watch, it, watch this movie, because one of them gave birth. Oh. So we had hundreds, thousands of floating, wow. tiny hippocampi all over. Mm -hmm.